Um, so welcome to the third BMT lecture, Black Business Cards, Findings from a Qualitative Study on the Integration of Palliative Care in hemato Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplant. I just wanted to thank the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada, who generously support us being able to put on these lectures every year. So before we get to our keynote speaker, I'd like to introduce Desiree Naylor from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, who's going to give us a small presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight's BMT lecture series presentation. As mentioned, my name is Desiree Naylor, and I'm the Community Services Manager for Alberta. It's so lovely to be here virtually once again. I remember around this time last year when we were finalizing the plans for what the first virtual BMT lecture series would look like in the middle of a pandemic. All those important details like registration links and figuring out where the mute button was. And here we are a year later being joined by HCPs from Halifax as well as from Victoria. So I want to thank the Unit 57 Committee for another amazing year and offering these sessions coast to coast. Before we begin the main presentation, I just wanted to highlight some resources that might be helpful for you and the patients you work with. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society offers a free continuing education program that you can access at your own pace and receive an electronic proof of participation. We have many great self-study trainings already posted. All trainings are offered by experts in the field, including many from right here in Alberta. And we'll be adding more grief and palliative care modules in the future. We are constantly adapting to the needs of the community and filling the gaps identified in our last national market research. Because a blood cancer diagnosis is unique, we have built a services offering that responds to the most urgent needs. We offer programs to support emotional and psychosocial aspects, as well as navigation to bereavement and palliative care resources. As a community service manager, my role is to be a compassionate connector. If you are working with someone who has lost, lost their loved one, I can help connect them to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's services and programs, or refer them to their local community supports and resources like bereavement support groups. When we launched our new website, bloodcancers.ca, we added a new section for those that have lost a loved one and need support for coping with grief and loss. We have added resources that were created to help guide through this time of grief. As part of this section of the website, we also added a space for our community to share how they remember their loved one. Sharing their story can be a great outlet to grieve, a chance to celebrate their loved one's life with others, and to give comfort to those going through something similar. We know the current situation presents many challenges to those affected by blood cancer and their families. Our community service managers can help. Please don't hesitate to connect patients you are working with to your local community service manager. And if you'd like to learn more about any of our programs and services, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you again for having us today. And I'm gonna unshare my screen in a second here and post some links in the chat box. Thank you so much, Desiree. I always love learning about what resources you have for us and for our patients. Uh, so next is our keynote speaker, Ann Booker. Rianne has been an oncology and palliative care nurse practitioner for 17 years. She is the president of the Canadian Association of Nurses in Oncology. She is currently working with the palliative and end of life care consult team and also does eligibility assessments for the MAID care team. She has been helping out with the COVID vaccination program and has also been helping out in the ICU at Foothills over the past six months. Rianne is working on her PhD through the University of Victoria, and the focus of her research is on the integration of palliative care in hematology and stem cell transplant. So without further ado, here's Rianne. Well, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much for uh, hosting this uh, webinar this evening. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce Jasper, my little co-presenter here. Um, if I don't introduce him, he'll invariably start barking randomly, so I will try to keep him quiet. Um, I'm now ridiculously nervous about this being recorded, so whenever I hear that something's recorded, I will um, seem to somehow make up words and stutter a lot, so I hope that won't be the case too much, but 
Um, again, thanks to the LLSC and uh, to the Unit 57 team for coordinating this and to all of you for attending. Let's try and share my screen here. Okay. Uh, can someone just give me a thumbs up or say if they can see these slides? We can That's see good. it. Okay. Awesome. Good. Um, okay, so today, um, just to, to do a brief um, territorial acknowledgement, I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the peoples of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising Siksika, Pikani, and Gainai First Nations, as well as Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, and the city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. There we go, I need to advance. There we go. Um, sorry, these are all the slides I have to include from the UFC. Um, so just making sure that there's no issues with copyright disclosure. I'm fine sending the slides to you. If you would like to receive them, just let me know. Just uh, send me um, either an email or a message in the chat box and I'll send them to you. And this is my financial disclosures. Of course, I have no uh, relevant financial relationships with um, pharmaceutical industry or medical supply companies. I have received funding for my PhD as studies um, as listed here. And so today I want to talk about um, the palliative care needs of patients and family caregivers who are going through um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. I want to talk briefly about um, the findings from our research thus far, including um, some studies we've done so far. And some of you, I think, have participated in our qualitative study. Don't worry, I won't identify you or any of the quotes that you've said specifically by name. Um, but I also want to talk about some barriers to and facilitators of integrating palliative care in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and then talk about um, the new study that we have just started recruitment for. And so I think many people still very much equate palliative care with end of life care. Uh, and that's not really surprising because the term palliative care um, was coined back in the 1970s. It's actually um, been credited to a Canadian physician, Dr. Balfour Mount, uh, who spent time with Dame Cicely Saunders in London at her hospice. And when he came back to Canada, he set up a palliative care unit um, in Montreal. And so palliative care really was born of the hospice movement in many ways. And so it's not surprising that a lot of people still equate palliative care with end of life care and hospice care. Um, but over the last few years, and, and I would say even decade or so, um, the definition of palliative care has really evolved. And the World Health Organization definition of palliative care now really emphasizes that palliative care can be appropriate and apl applicable early in the course of illness and can be provided alongside um, uh, therapies such as disease directed treatments like chemotherapy and radiation therapy, even if cure is still the goal. Um, and so I think some of us understand this definition, um, but broadly, I think there's still misperceptions about palliative care. And um, even amongst healthcare professionals, I think there's still misperceptions uh, that abound today. So why do we need palliative care? Well, we know in oncology that there are multiple issues that can cause suffering for our patients. And so definitely there can be physical issues, um, pain, symptoms associated with the cancer or the treatment. There can be psychosocial issues for sure that are really profound for our patients, um, practical issues, um, disease management, of course, is, is front and center for a lot of our patients. Um, and then at the end of life, there can be um, end of life care management, death management, and then bereavement and loss and grief care afterwards. And so just to, to make the point now that we're really emphasizing that early palliative care is probably um, something that we should all strive to. Um, and early palliative care is better, like before it hits 4.30 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. I think we see this sometimes in the consult service that we get referrals right at the end of the day on Fridays. And I, I personally don't think that there's any such thing as a bad palliative care referral. I'll happily take a palliative care referral at the end of the day. Um, I just think it's really important that we start getting more referrals. So what do palliative care docs or, or what does a palliative care team do all day? Um, there's all kinds of different team members. Um, I think I'll start with this slide, sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, so there's different types of palliative care. Primary palliative care really is something that I personally believe that all oncology nurses and clinicians should have some skills and competencies and be prepared to provide. So that would be things you know, basic palliative care, like having um, like conversations about uh, goals and wishes, um, symptom management, assessment of symptoms and things like that. I think these are things that all of you do very well already. Uh, and I would argue that most people are, are quite skilled in oncology at providing primary palliative care. And then as things get, become more complex, 
uh, you can shift to more, um, uh, you know, specialized palliative care services. Um, so the secondary palliative care, um, uh, I guess, group would be things like uh, specialty palliative care uh, consultants. That's something that I do in my uh, my day job. Um, and then we have the tertiary palliative care where that's very specialized care. So we've got the inpatient unit uh, at Foothills, that's unit 50 or unit 47, um, where that is, you know, really focusing on intensive symptom management and um, really addressing complex needs of patients. And so these cartoons were created by a palliative care doctor, Dr. Nathan Gray. Uh, he used to be at Duke and he's now um, at Johns Hopkins and Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center in Maryland. Um, and I love that he did that. He kind of did a Richard Scarry um, thing where he created all these different characters, these palliative care uh, team members. And so we're fortunate in Calgary to be able to have um, all these different services. So we've got outpatient palliative care clinics, we've got hospital palliative care consultations, uh, we have uh, hospice care. So we've got in Calgary, seven uh, hospice facilities. Those are inpatient hospice facilities. Um, and then we also have community-based palliative care, home care, and things like that. Unfortunately, we know that um, palliative care services are not uh, equitably distributed. And so for people in rural and remote areas, um, they don't always have all of these services available, um, which is very challenging for sure. And then Dr. Gray <laughs> created these non-traditional palliative care teammates that he'd love to have. Um, so a scribe, um, a team driver, a linebacker, and then a corgi puppy because quality of life. And I would say, yeah, Jasper is the uh, palliative care team member that I would love to have. And Jasper's actually got some qualifications and he visits at Bethany Care Center here in Cochrane. Um, and the residents there really like him. And so historically, again, when we used to think about palliative care, it was traditionally something that would be um, integrated into care when there was no longer any disease directed options. Um, so if somebody at time of diagnosis was perhaps diagnosed with incurable cancer, we might involve palliative care at that time, or if perhaps they had a curable um, or a treatable cancer, um, palliative care would be reserved until things recurred or progressed. Um, and, that, and that was kind of how we did things. So again, it's unsurprising that people still equate palliative care with end of life care because that's how we kind of did things in the past. But more recently, there's been this shift to integrating palliative care early in the disease and treatment trajectory, uh, just recognizing that if we integrate palliative care earlier, there can be a number of different, um, look at, I'm already putting him to sleep. I hope you're not all falling asleep already. Um, that if we integrate palliative care earlier, there can be a number of, of beneficial outcomes for the patients and family caregivers. Um, and so there's this recognition, this is the bow tie model that was uh, created by Dr. Pippa Holly in BC, um, that if we integrate palliative care early on, and that might be more of a focus on pain and symptom management at the beginning, um, and then it, as things change and evolve, there may be more focus on end of life and, and um, hospice care, uh, and then after death, of course, bereavement care. So we know from studies that have been done, and predominantly, I would say that the studies done to date have really focused on patients with solid tumors, um, but there's clear evidence to suggest that there are a number of outcomes that improve if we integrate palliative care early on. Um, so improved symptom management, uh, improved quality of life for patients and family caregivers, better prognostic uh, and illness understanding. And this is really important so that patients can make uh, appropriate medical decisions. And if they really have a better understanding of their prognosis, um, that can really influence um, decision making around treatment. And, and most patients really desire prognostic um, discussions and accurate information. Uh, I will say that I think there's a subset of patients, and this is from my own personal experience, but also from interviewing many of you, um, that there's a subset of patients that really don't want to know their, their prognosis and they don't want that honest disclosure. And I think for some patients, they cope by denial. Um, and so it's really important to assess uh, early on what the patient's preferences for information are um, and trying to tailor that. Of course, that's a very individualized approach uh, and can take more time, but really kind of getting a sense of, of what the patient wants in terms of information provision. Um, we know caregiver outcomes can improve with early palliative care. Patient and caregiver mood can improve. And then end of life uh, quality indicators and outcomes such as ICU, hospice use, emergency use, um, chemotherapy within the last two weeks of life. And then resource utilization, I guess that's tied into the previous one. 
And a, a number of studies have also found improved survival um, for patients who had palliative care. Um, and the, the landmark study there was done in, was reported, published in, in 2010, and that was Jennifer Temmel and her group um, out of MassGen and Boston, um, where they looked at patients with advanced lung cancer. And they had um, early integration of palliative care for um, some patients, and then they compared that to standard care. And they found that there was a survival benefit for the patients that had early palliative care. So we also know that if we don't integrate palliative care early, um, there can be underuse of all these different things that we know that um, patients can want and can lead to improvement of their quality of life. And there can be overuse of things like life-sustaining therapies, chemotherapy, radiation, ICU admissions, and things like that. Um, and you know, it, it's tricky because these end-of-life quality indicators uh, that have been well-described in, in the literature may not necessarily apply to patients with blood cancers. And so that's also been a focus of my research is trying to ascertain or, or figure out what patients with blood cancers really want uh, at end of life. So, you know, um, somebody in our qualitative study said that hematology gets the black marks for giving chemo towards the end of life. But chemotherapy in patients with blood cancers sometimes can be used as a palliative measure. So it might actually really help to reduce symptoms or, um, or issues the patient's having towards end of life. Um, similarly, patients with blood cancers may not desire um, a home death. Um, so if you're thinking about things like sanguination or you know, a bleeding catastrophe, it may not be desirable to, to have somebody die at home. Um, and in our qualitative study, we really found that um, that relationship that patients form with their hematology team and the team specifically on Unit 57, this came out a lot, um, that patients really felt at home on Unit 57 and they really mm -hmm. felt supported and they really felt um, that it wasn't a bad thing to necessarily spend their, their uh, remaining time on Unit 57. And so for those uh, who are joining from places other, the, other than Calgary, Unit 57 is our inpatient hematology unit at our, at our uh, um, major acute care center here in Calgary. And so this is a very busy slide showing that there have been a number of studies that have looked at um, palliative care and standard oncologic care. Um, and, you know, the, the green boxes are showing um, that there was a benefit for integrating palliative care early. Um, you know, the, the, the yellowish um, is showing that there was really no difference between the groups. And then the orange um, color is showing that there were mixed findings. Um, and so, you know, I think it really depends on the study design. It really depends on what the authors or the researchers were looking for in terms of outcomes. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, the research to date has shown that there have been improvements in terms of um, quality of life for sure, uh, symptom burden reductions and things like that. Um, it's important to note, and I'm not sure if you can see here, but most of these studies have been done in patients with solid tumors. Very few have included patients with hematologic malignancies. So there's definitely a gap in the, in the research here. So I've always been fascinated by this idea that there could be a survival benefit for patients who have early palliative care. And I wondered what that could be due to. Um, we don't know for sure what the mechanisms involved with the improved outcomes are. So in terms of survival benefit, it's possible that better symptom management leads to um, people being able to stay on treatment cycles better and you know, taking fewer um, breaks or requiring fewer um, interruptions in their treatment. So maybe that is what confers the survival benefit. Um, and then in, in terms of the quality of life and symptom reductions, it could just be that there's this extra layer of support throughout uh, the treatment trajectory that confers the, the benefits in terms of quality of life and symptom um, benefit. Um, and so I think the jury's still out on that one. Um, some researchers have suggested that perhaps it's uh, improved coping skills, um, that are conferred by the uh, intervention, um, but I think it's tricky. So a lot of the studies, um, when you look at the intervention itself, what is it that palliative care is providing? And the study that we've modeled our work on is, is the one that was done by Arij Al-Jawari and her group at MassGen. Um, and basically what the, the researchers did is they met with people on a regular basis and they had discussions. There wasn't a huge amount of uh, active intervention, so they weren't making huge changes to people's symptom management or pain management regimens or anything like that. 
it was just this extra layer of um, support conferred by or, or provided by um, conversations and, um, you know, allowing patients to have extra time with somebody. Um, so I think, you know, that part is still a little bit of a mystery. What is it about the palliative care intervention specifically that's providing the survival benefit? Um, but at the end of the day, if it's improving uh, quality of life and caregiver outcomes and, and, and those kinds of things, um, it, it's very interesting. So this is what we're doing in our, in our uh, randomized clinical trial that we just started recruitment for. Um, so ASCO a couple of years ago, the American Society of Clinical Oncology came out with some guidelines um, about integrating palliative care into standard on oncology care. And basically their recommendation was the palliative care was early palliative care was recommended for patients with advanced cancer or those with high symptom burden. And I think any of you who work with patients with blood cancers can argue or agree um, that patients with blood cancers experience high symptom burden. And certainly patients going through hematopoietic stem, stem cell transplantation, bone marrow transplantation uh, definitely experience high symptom burden. Um, also in this paper, um, the authors highlighted that the majority of research to date has been in patients with solid tumors and more research is needed across tumor types and especially in hematology. Um, they also acknowledged that um, caregiver outcomes and caregiver, oops, my apologies, um, caregiver and fa uh, sorry, family and caregiver um, um, experience is needed. And so that's something we've incorporated into our studies as well. So I think there are lots of barriers to integrating primary and specialty palliative care. And so specifically related to hematology, um, it's a challenge for sure that prognostic uncertainty, so not knowing when somebody is going to, um, you know, that there, there really are no um, well-defined signposts when somebody is going to shift from um, disease-directed um, response to that palliative care, supportive care um, uh, situation. So, um, you know, patients with solid tumors, you have a little bit more of a predictable um, trajectory, although I think that the immuno oncology agents are really leveling the playing field here. Um, and that not so much that it's harder to prognosticate patients with solid tumors, um, but on, or, or similar to patients with um, um, blood cancers who go through bone marrow transplant, there can be very significant treatment related issues that can come up. So, um, you know, that's also a challenge with heme malignancies is, is that it's not always the underlying disease that can be the problem. It can be a treatment related complication like graft versus host disease in the context of, of stem cell transplant um, that can happen, you know, even a few years after the patients had their transplant. Um, there may be no evidence of underlying um, disease that, that the cancer may be gone, but it might be a treatment related complication that comes up. Um, the other challenge I think is that patients with blood cancers can, can really have a, a rapid decline. So they can be doing, doing very, very well. And then all of a sudden they relapse and that window between when they relapse and when they pass away, it can be very, very short. Um, and so that can also be a barrier um, for knowing you know, when to involve or not even having enough time to involve palliative care. And I think there still remains a lot of um, misperceptions, as I said, and stigma around palliative care. So uh, even amongst healthcare professionals, uh, there's still a lot of misperceptions that palliative care um, is the same as end of life care or hospice care. And so that can represent a barrier and, it, and particularly in the context of um, bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant, that's a curative intent context. And so it might seem a bit odd to be introducing somebody to palliative care early on if your goal is still very much to treat or cure um, the cancer with, with transplant. Uh, patients might wonder, well, why are you introducing palliative care uh, to me, if we're still trying to cure this cancer, um, not such a, an issue if people really understand that palliative care is more than end of life care or different than end of life care. Um, but I think there's still so many misperceptions about what palliative care is and what it isn't. Um, and so that can represent a, a huge barrier for sure. And then we know for sure that um, palliative care resources and services, um, you know, they're not widely available, especially in rural and remote areas. Um, we also know that that most nursing school and medical school curricula don't have um, universal or um, standardized palliative care rotations or uh, content in the curricula, uh, so that can represent a huge barrier as well.
so the p word i see this often when uh, i go to see patients and i introduce myself as being from palliative care sometimes there's this deer in the headlights look or this shock um initially um and camilla zimmerman she works uh, at princess margaret uh, cancer center in toronto and she looked at this um, in the past uh, patients and caregivers perspectives on on palliative care and what they found was, again, the majority of participants felt that palliative care was the same as uh, death or end of life care. Um, and it's not surprising because, again, palliative care is often presented to patients as a last resort. Um, and so if it's presented as a last resort, it's not a shock then or, or it's not a surprise that patients might think of it then as being the same as end of life care. Um, some patients actually really felt that palliative care should be called something else altogether. Um, but other people in the study felt that it shouldn't be called something else. There was one person in the study that said that it doesn't matter what you call it, you could call it hula dancing, and then people would be scared of hula dancing. Uh, so it's just part of this whole idea that, especially in our Western culture, we don't talk a lot about death and dying. Uh, and so anything associated with death and dying could be potentially seen as, as scary or, um, you know, anxiety inducing for patients. Um, uh, Dalal and uh, their team I believe this was in um, Texas, uh, once they changed their, their name of their program from palliative care to supportive care, um, their referrals increased by about 40%. And they started getting a lot more referrals in the out outpatient setting and earlier in, in patients' trajectories of disease. And so there may be something to that. Um, in our own work, in the qualitative study, we heard from pretty much all of the 28 participants in the study, and that was patients, family caregivers, and uh, uh, clinicians that yes, we should probably think about changing the, the name from uh, palliative care to something else. And so looking specifically at the palliative care needs of patients with blood cancers, um, you know, so during treatment, we know that there can be intense uh, symptom burden and quality of life impairments uh, because of the illness and the treatment. Um, there can be profound psychosocial distress, anxiety, depression, um, social isolation. So, you know, this came out also in our study that uh, a lot of these patients who for years um, have been used to isolating, uh, particularly when they're neutropenic and things, now here's the pandemic and other people have to isolate and things. So um, we heard that a lot, that the, the isolation um, was interesting for people who'd already been previously doing that, but it's hugely um, significant in terms of what that means for people's social lives. Um, during survivorship, so once disease-directed treatment is done, there can still be physical and psychosocial um, symptoms that persist for years beyond treatment. Um, many of you know that I, I um, was very interested in, um, um, you know, ran a sexual health clinic at Tom Baker for about five years, I guess, and even before that um, had uh, an interest in sexual health issues and patients who'd undergone treatment for blood cancers. And so this is a huge issue for a lot of patients. Um, but other things like fatigue or um, neuropathic pain and different things like that can really persist for years beyond treatment. Um, and then, of course, at end of life, there can be some unique needs for patients with blood cancers. Um, and historically, we've used these end of life quality metrics like hospitalizations or chemotherapy and things like that as being kind of um, negatives or um, things that are not desirable at end of life, but I think that those may be different for patients with blood cancers, and there may be some some reason, some good reasons to use uh, chemotherapy at end of life if it helps to alleviate uh, symptoms for patients. Um, so this study looked at patients with solid tumors and patients with blood cancers, just in terms of symptom burden, um, and you can see that patients with solid tumors and, hematol and hematologic malignancies had similarities in terms of the severities of their um, symptoms. Um, and, and other authors have found uh, similar results as well, um, showing that patients with blood cancers and those going through bone marrow transplants have at least equal, if not more, um, severity of symptoms compared to patients with solid tumors. Um, this, again, is speaking to the quality of end of life metrics, I guess, in, in patients with blood cancers. Um, so th they looked, the, the authors here looked at um, over 800 decedents of blood cancers, or uh, sorry, 800 decedents of cancers overall, um, 113 had blood cancers. And then they looked at different uh, metrics uh, in the last month of life. And you can see that um, patients with blood cancers had more 
um, hospital admissions, they had more ICU admissions, they had more hospital deaths, uh, they had more chemotherapy. Um, and so again, you know, this came out and one of the um, hematologists in our qualitative study uh, said, yeah, this, this gets uh, hematology black marks. Um, and I'm not necessarily convinced that that's a bad thing for these patients because sometimes chemotherapy in this context can really help to alleviate symptoms and improve quality of life. Um, so we may need different metrics for patients with blood cancers um, at end of life. Um, this study looked at, it was uh, more than 2,000 patients um, and close to 400 were pediatric patients, uh, 461 were young adults and close to 1,300 were adults. Um, but they looked at intensity markers in the last um, year of life and this was end of life care uh, intensity after transplant and they look of course they found that there was a lot of hospital death 83 percent of the participants died in hospital and nearly 50 percent had uh, icu admissions um, and medical intensity varied according to age it's not surprising so younger patients had more an intense end of life care or more aggressive end of life care and the authors concluded that patients dying within a year of inpatient allo a stem cell transplant receive medically intense end of life care with variations related to age, underlying diagnosis, and presence of comorbidities at time of uh, transplant. And they suggested that for further studies are needed to determine if these patterns are consistent with patient and family goals. And I think that's what's been missing so far in the literature is that, you know, again, we'll give bad marks, I guess, or the black marks uh, for these kinds of things happening towards end of life for, for these patients, but it may not be that this is a bad thing for those patients and their loved ones. Um, you know, if they've gone through everything to get to transplant and they've gone through transplant, there may be an expectation or a desire to pursue these aggressive or intensive treatments towards end of life. And I think it really probably depends on so many different things like the patient age and um, all kinds of different things, their goals and wishes and, and what matters to them. So again, um, I think this slide just really emphasizes that there really will never be one size fits all approach uh, to palliative care for patients with blood cancers. And, you know, it, it, I think there's a lot of misperception and I will even say amongst uh, palliative care providers, um, I don't think people realize that blood cancers represent such a, such a heterogene heterogeneous group of patients. Um, there's so many different types of blood cancers and within them, uh, there can be very indolent disease. Uh, there can be very aggressive disease. And then there can be somebody with indolent disease that transforms, transforms to aggressive disease. Um, and so there's so much uh, unpredictability um, that really makes blood cancers unique compared to solid tumors. Um, but again, to me, that prognostic uncertainty and, and those challenges really argue for integrating palliative care earlier on because it's really challenging to predict who's going to need palliative care and who's going to, you know, um, experience a rapid decline um, or, you know, experience these life-threatening treatment-related complications. It's difficult to predict that. Um, so integrating palliative care early on and making it standard and routine would really then, I think, um, result in optimal quality of life for, for all. And if it turns out that the patient doesn't need um, palliative care, and again, my bias is that it might be more supportive care and then at times it might shift to more palliative and end of life care um, but at least involving the palliative care team early on would result in less um, less of a traumatic change i think for patients and again because they forge such a close relationship with their hematology team um, that then if you have to introduce this new team um, rapidly if there's a sudden shift in their in their disease situation or their status uh, it's traumatic for the patient and their family because they they know the the hematology and BMT team so well um, that here at the eleventh hour you're suddenly introducing this new team. It can be very traumatic. So some people have suggested that there can be uh, different triggers for um, for advanced care planning discussions. And so again, because we don't have those same signposts uh, as we might have with people uh, who have solid tumors. Uh, that these perhaps might represent some potential signposts or, or triggers for having goals of care discussions with patients. And this is one example uh, for patients with lymphoma. So anyone with relapsed or refractory disease, uh, worsening performance status, of course, it's pretty subjective. Um, organ insufficiency, you know, if we're talking about transplant, if we're talking about CAR T cell therapy, um, 
And I think it's really challenging because I think the surprise question in hematology and BMT, you know, pretty much you'd answer yes to, um, or uh, so you'd answer no, you wouldn't be surprised if this patient would die in the next year. That, that again, I think is a, a unique challenge with hematology and BMT patients is that we see so many people get very close to the brink of death and many of them will recover. And to try to figure out who will and who won't, you really need a crystal ball and nobody has that. Um, and so, you know, it'd be great if we had some really um, reliable or consistent kind of predictors, um, but we really don't. And so again, my bias would be, you know, for, for heme patients, we really should be integrating palliative care early on because I think, you know, we wouldn't be surprised uh, if most of our patients in, in heme and BNT would pass away in the next year. Um, and so, yeah, having specialty palliative care consultation for patients with lymphoma, again, here's some potential triggers or signposts. Um, so symptom burden, um, psychological distress, difficulty coping with illness, um, misperceptions about illness, understanding, uh, complex goals of care discussions. I think we could check off a, a lot of these for many of our patients. I think just the nature of, of having a blood cancer and especially going through bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant, I think it just automatically, a lot of these things would be checked off. Uh, so this was interesting. This author um, created this um, kind of score or this um, algorithm for determining if somebody should have a palliative care consult. And it was based on all these different uh, criteria. So, you know, looking at their performance status, um, if they had graft versus host disease or some of the other complications associated, associated with transplant, um, mm -hmm. physical or psychosocial comorbidities and things like that. And, and a score greater than five would trigger then a specialty palliative care consult. Um, and so, you know, some of these things may be helpful, um, but again, my bias would be that it'd be probably easier if we integrated um, early palliative care for, for most of our patients going through transplant. Um, and so to date, there have only been a handful of studies that have looked at um, integration of palliative care for patients with blood cancers and only one randomized clinical trial, uh, and that was Arish Al Jawari. Um, and she and her team looked at um, integrating palliative care early for patients. Uh, the intervention was an inpatient palliative care uh, consultation. Um, and this is very much what we built our study on, although our study, because of COVID, um, will be mostly virtual. It will be ex exclusively virtual and now, and so we'll be getting people not just in the inpatient setting, but uh, also in the outpatient setting. And so this is El Jawari's study. Uh, this was published in, um, the early data was published in 2015, and then um, more uh, finalized data published in 2016. And so they randomized 160 patients to either standard care or to their palliative care intervention. Um, they also looked at caregiver, family caregiver outcomes as well. And they found improvements at uh, two weeks um, post. Um, and some of these uh, improvements in quality of life, depression, anxiety uh, were persistent or um, durable. Um, the intervention itself was only uh, delivered by a nurse or physician. So again, my bias is that it would be great to have multidisciplinary involvement. So psychosocial, um, a psychologist or social worker uh, would probably be quite helpful as well. Um, and so some of, some of that research and my experiences, um, uh, for those who don't know, I worked in the uh, blood and marrow transplant program at Tom Baker for over a decade before I moved into palliative care. Um, and so that, coupled with the, the research coming out of uh, Boston, really made me curious about, you know, what could we do uh, to help our patients with blood cancers and those going through bone marrow transplant. Um, and so this, all of this re research is what I'm doing for my PhD. Um, and I started with um, some secondary data and data analyses to look at what was already happening here in Alberta. Um, and so the first project I did was a secondary data analysis looking at oncology clinicians across Alberta um, regarding their perceptions on integrating palliative care and oncology. So I looked specifically at the hematology oncology clinicians. Um, and then I also looked at uh, patterns of referrals for patients with blood cancers to palliative care and hospice. Uh, and then last year, I guess it was 2020 and 2021, 
Um, I interviewed 28 people. Uh, it was patients, uh, family caregivers, and hematology bone marrow um, clinicians. Uh, and, you know, ask them about their thoughts and perceptions on integrating palliative care into the care of patients going through bone marrow transplant. Um, and then the, those two, two studies or those two phases uh, led to uh, the development of our, of my big, uh, I guess, dissertation research project, which is a pragmatic randomized clinical trial to examine the impact of early integration of palliative care for patients going through um, uh, stem cell or bone marrow transplant for blood cancers uh, and their caregivers. And so um, we received, we had ethics approval back in January, <laughs> but there were all kinds of other approvals. We needed operational approvals and things. Um, and so that all came through in April. So we are open to recruitment now. And the primary outcome of the study will be quality of life for patients. But we're also looking at caregiver quality of life, uh, symptom burden for patients, prognostic understanding for both, both patients and caregivers. And then we'll also look at survival um, as well at one in five years. Uh, so this is the paper that we published um, looking at perspectives of hematology oncology clinicians about integrating palliative care and oncology. Um, and so our final sample size was 263 clinicians. Um, of these, we only had 30 hematology oncology clinicians. Um, but there were some unique things that came out of this. This was a, a quantitative study, mostly. Uh, people could also enter in some qualitative comments. Um, but hematology oncology clinicians uh, thought that uh, th they identified a couple of big challenges or barriers they thought would be um, relevant when integrating palliative care uh, for patients with blood cancers. And one of them was that patients really harbor negative perceptions about palliative care. And that was different. Um, uh, no, sorry, um, the uh, solid tumor oncologist thought that that was also um, uh, something that would be a barrier. And then limit, limited time or competing needs was also something that was raised by both the hematology and solid tumor clinicians. Um, the difference was that hematology clinicians felt that palliative care referral criteria were too strict um, and that they would have to make substantial changes to their practice to incorporate palliative care earlier. And there were some qualitative comments um, that were included, uh, and that related mostly to, in terms of the, the criteria being too strict, things like um, patients not being able to still have blood transfusions uh, or palliative chemo, particularly in hospice. And so that was a barrier um, that, that kind of meant that hematology clinicians didn't want to refer people to palliative care. Um, but we didn't have any specific information about why people thought that this would represent a big change to their practice. Um, so it was kind of interesting. And I talked to people about that during the qualitative interviews and most people said that, no, it really wouldn't represent a big change in their practice that, it, it, you know, especially if we made it standard, it wouldn't be um, a big deal. And so the second project uh, I undertook was looking at patterns of end of life care for patients with blood cancers. And so, again, and I don't think it's necessarily fair, fair to say that this is a bad thing. Um, the aggressive care in particular, I think, you know, we, we shouldn't necessarily jump to conclusions and say that, that that's a bad thing for hematology patients until we know um, what patients in there and their loved ones want. Um, but you can see that there was significantly fewer palliative care referrals for patients with um, blood cancers and that patients with blood cancers had more aggressive end of life care. So I looked at that more specifically. Uh, and so there were more than 1800 patients um, who had died of blood cancers. And that was between 2000, um, 2006 and 2016, I believe. And um, you'll see, uh, so roughly 55% male, 44% female, um, and then broken down by age group and type of cancer and how many comorbidities they had and then where they lived. So we didn't have a huge number of patients who lived rurally, but um, uh, we did have some. And then uh, in terms of palliative care exposure, great news that 60% um, of patients had uh, palliative care exposure um, at some point. Uh, so this is any palliative care exposure before they died. Um, but you can see here that 20% um, had palliative care exposure in that last week before they died. Um, and 50 more than 50% uh, had palliative care only within the last three months uh, before they died. So ideally, we want people to have palliative care at least three months or more before they before they die. 
unsurprisingly, um, a, a lot of the patients died in hospital. Um, and, that, and that's not hugely discrepant from the, the overall norm. Um, so roughly half of patients uh, will die in hospital. Um, but so, you know, 56.7% of people dying in hospital. But again, is that a bad thing? And there's some research out of um, England that suggests maybe it's not, that maybe patients with blood cancers don't necessarily want to die at home. Um, and then in terms of aggressive care um, before um, people died, 62% um, did have aggressive care. Um, and, and that was just, um, that overall metric was, was used. So we looked at all these different factors. So it could be an emergency room visit before they died, hospital admission, um, a hospital admission that lasted longer than two weeks, ICU admission and things like that. Um, and so if you looked at the median time from diagnosis to death, you know, it was, it was quite a significant chunk of time. Um, and the diagnosis uh, to first palliative care consult, also a pretty significant chunk of time. Um, but then the first palliative care consult to, to death, you know, we didn't, we didn't uh, see very much time there. So this suggests that there is, you know, an opportunity for us to intervene and introduce patients to palliative care earlier. And then I looked at uh, differences between the groups uh, or differences uh, for, for, for different variables. So looking um, across the different types of diagnoses, um, patients with leukemia were less likely to have palliative care exposure. Um, patients with multiple myeloma were more likely to have chemo um, within the last two weeks before they died uh, and more likely to have new chemo. Uh, what we don't know here is, you know, was it because the chemo was being used for symptom management, um, or was it the patient's desire that they wanted to do, you know, more disease-directed therapy in the last month of life? We just don't know that. Um, and then again, um, patients with leukemia were less likely to have palliative care for more than three months. If we looked uh, at differences between males and females, um, males were less likely to have uh, palliative care exposure and more likely to have ICU admissions in the last month before they died. Um, and then this is really unsurprising, but looking at age differences. So uh, again, younger patients were more likely to have uh, death in hospital, um, some of the other measures as well, um, ICU admissions and um, hospital admissions, aggressive care overall, uh, less likely to have palliative care exposure than older patients. And to me, this is a, a, a real big red flag, I think, is that um, patients who lived in rural areas, and again, that number wasn't very big, it was 185 patients, but still, um, if you looked at differences between rural and urban patients, um, rural patients were way more likely to die in hospital. Um, they were quite a bit more likely to have uh, no palliative care exposure. Um, again, they were more likely to have hospital admissions, ER visits, uh, overall, way more likely to have aggressive care and quite a bit uh, less likely to have palliative care for more than three months. And I think some of this probably speaks to lack of services, obviously, in rural areas. Um, but this represents a really good opportunity for intervention, because if we're able to help support these patients, and we're hoping through our study that we can show that even remote or virtual support could probably, well, we hope it will help to uh, avert hospital admissions and ER visits and things like that, um, and, and hopefully help expose um, more rural patients to palliative care. Um, but I think it, a huge issue here is that these services simply just aren't available for a lot of people in rural and remote areas. Um, and so this next study that uh, we're embarking on is, uh, um, oh, sorry, first I, I guess I will talk about the quality of study. Um, I was jumping ahead. Um, so I interviewed 28 participants. Uh, we had eight patients, 16 clinicians. And so if any of you who I interviewed are on the call tonight, thank you so much for participating. Uh, we only had four caregivers, uh, family caregivers. Um, of course, because of COVID, we had to recruit exclusively rem remotely or virtually. So it was a little bit more challenging, I think, than if I would have been able to go to the cancer center. Um, but we were able to, to interview um, these patients and some of the themes that came out um, were the, the physical and psychosocial symptoms and distress associated with the transplant. Um, that there were, I, I would say, uh, challenging um, things that came up in terms of expectations of transplant. So a lot of patients and family caregivers 
talked about how transplant was way worse than they thought it would be. Um, they, they had some challenges in terms of um, prognostic understanding. Um, the caregiver experience really came out. Uh, caregivers really felt that uh, their needs were, were um, largely unmet. Um, and that's not saying anything bad at all about services. I will tell you 100%. I would say I think it was almost every patient and caregiver spoke so highly of the care they received um, while they were going through transplant especially. Um, some of this related to when they got back to their, their hometowns, uh, especially for patients who were in rural areas, um, that they felt it was very challenging to get uh, support and to know who to call when they had issues. Um, again, you know, perceptions of palliative care and stigma associated with palliative care really came out. And then um, we did also uh, hear some things about COVID-19. So um, just, you know, talking about the need for palliative care in, in transplant. So um, here was a clinician saying, you know, you look at um, graft versus host and you can have somebody who's failed all lines of treatment for graft versus host and they're day 150 and they've spent the last half year in the hospital bed and realistically what are the chances of this person getting out and leaving having a uh, living a meaningful life to them um, and then this notion that there's a certain amount of physical suffering that's just assumed it's accepted that there's going to be a high intensity of symptom burden um, and that wasn't necessarily something that they felt was accepted by clinicians but that patients coming into it really felt that there was just going to be this level of of intense symptom burden um, one of the recipients said, I really didn't understand what I was going to go through. Um, and then, you know, also comments about the psychosocial piece after transplant, especially that, you know, physical symptoms, managing physical symptoms um, was something that a lot of clinicians felt very skilled at doing and very comfortable doing. Um, but assessing and managing things like depression or anxiety or some of the psychosocial issues, um, you know, that that could be more challenging for clinicians. And then again, you know, this uniqueness of hematology and, and transplant. So somebody can be doing very, very well and then not within weeks. And you go from full on cure to end of life care within a month. And sometimes it's even less than that. Uh, so it's very difficult to switch that mindset. So and again, this notion that it might not be the underlying cancer that kills a patient. Um, it might be the complications of immune dysfunction, infections, you know, things like graft versus host. That's very different. Um, the, the comment had come out that, you know, with solid tumors, there's a more predictable kind of inexorable decline. Um, but with patients with blood cancers, it can be this rapid switch. Um, and again, this comment that, you know, it's not to give non curative chemo so close to the end of life, and that gets you black marks, if you're slinging chemo in the last few weeks of life. But the trouble is often for hematologic cancers, the chemo can be fairly gentle, and well tolerated and often control the cancer symptoms the best. A little bit of daily atopicide can actually control the pain from the lymphoma mass better than morphine. So again, there's this notion that we in palliative care and hospice have no issues giving opioids, um, but what about a transfusion that might help alleviate severe dyspnea or fatigue? Um, why can't that be considered or low dose chemo or gentle chemo that might be helped, that might be used to alleviate symptoms? That's a palliative intent measure um, so why can't we, why would that give you black marks um, if the intent is palliative, if the intent is to alleviate uh, symptoms and improve quality of life? And so the caregivers, uh, this was a, a young woman who said, uh, I'll be honest with you, I can't speak for the patient, but I get flashbacks all the time. I'm definitely experiencing some PTSD, a lot of trauma associated, and I've had a lot of my own physical symptoms in my own body arise from the extra anxiety I feel now all the time. Um, Another said, I'm not comparing his situation to mine in the slightest, but I know I just feel like a very different person now and not in a way I like, you know, I'm way more anxious, way more worried than I ever used to be. Um, as someone else said, I guess I would say in general, it's like more support for the caregivers and just recognizing that we're going through a lot too. Uh, I know when the patient got back and to this day, when I run into someone I know, they'll say, oh, how's the patient doing? I'm so glad he's doing okay. Or I'm so glad he's doing better, but I rarely get asked how I'm doing. Uh, another one said, I know for myself, uh, going into the medical field as a career was never something that interested me because I'm a pretty sensitive person. I'm pretty laid back and can be pretty emotional. So this whole experience has just further reiterated that for me. I'm not meant to be a nurse, but I kind of felt I was kind of shoved into that role and I hated it to be perfectly honest. It was extremely stressful. Another said in stage one, as a caregiver prior to transplant, I was a little bit of emotional support. I was a taxi driver during stage two hospitalization. 
I was a little bit of emotional support because she was so out of it that she doesn't remember any of it. So I was a little bit of emotional support. I was a distraction and company, and I was involved in protecting her interests because I was able to put two sentences together in a coherent paragraph. I'll be honest with you, caregiving in stage three is 10 times harder than the other two combined and it never ends. And this was somebody who was, uh, the recipient, had, the patient had been, she was seven or eight years post-transplant at that point. Um, the term palliative care, yeah. So this person, this patient said, the first thing I think is this is not the exact conversation I wanna have. It'd be, you know, the whole idea of dying. I think when it comes to the words palliative care, it means, to me, it seems like we're giving up hope and you're just prepping me for the ultimate death. Um, a, a transplant clinician said, I think the palliative care is very scary and synonymous with I'm dying and I'm being abandoned. Uh, another said, I think my gut reaction would have been, oh, okay, does this mean it's incurable? Am I dying? It probably would have raised a little bit of anxiety in me had they not explained exactly what they meant. My gut response would have been end of life care. And so it was interesting to me because there was one uh, transplant recipient who recited almost verbatim the World Health Organization of Palliative Care. His mom was a hospice nurse, um, but he said it would have caused severe anxiety if someone from palliative care would have walked into his room. Uh, and then there was also a, a transplant patient who was a nurse herself. And same thing, she said it would have evoked a lot of anxiety. Uh, so I think once people understood what palliative care was and there was some discussion and explanation about it, they were okay with it. But there's still such an initial gut reaction to that terminology for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, phase phase one and two of, of the work we've done uh, has led to the, the uh, development, or I guess I've used those findings to help inform the development of a randomized clinical trial uh, to look at early integration of palliative and supportive care. Uh, and so I did ask this question to, to people in the study. Uh, what if we called it palliative and supportive care? Uh, most people were very okay with that term. Uh, and it shortens nicely to something called PALS, so P-A-L-S. Um, but they didn't like palliative care on its own. Um, and then other people didn't like supportive care on its own. Um, a lot of people felt that supportive care sounded nice, but it didn't really fully capture um, what palliative care uh, might be able to do for patients. So. Uh, we settled on palliative, palliative and supportive care. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping to recruit uh, quite a few patients for this study uh, and to look at the impact of um, the intervention on uh, patient reported quality of life for patients who are going through transplant for blood cancers, uh, to look at the impact on physical symptoms, um, to look at the impact on caregiver quality of life, um, and also to look at um, how this might impact patients' understanding and family caregivers' understanding of prognosis. Um, and so this is just the consort diagram. So looking at um, pretty much anybody who is pre-transplant for a blood cancer is who we want to involve in the study. Um, of course, because uh, of some limitations now that we're doing things uh, virtually and remotely, it will be more difficult to, to use language lines. So um, uh, we want people to be able to read and understand English, um, and we are um, excluding patients who are going through transplant for a non-malignant condition. Um, and this is just so that we can compare our results to similar studies, um, and particularly uh, El Jawari's study. And so once we have um, uh, patients and their family caregivers enrolled, we'll randomize them to either the um, standard care arm um, or the outpatient palliative care intervention. And the people in the standard care arm can still access palliative care um, if they wish. Um, and so we'll be uh, trying to track that as much as we can from chart reviews. Um, but you know, people in the standard care arm can still have palliative care consultation and support if they need. Uh, and we'll be looking to collect data. Um, and this will all be done by REDCap. Um, and we've used that similar time frame to what Al Jawari used in, in their study. Um, again, this is so that we can compare our results to their results. Uh, and this is what the timeline will look like. So baseline, everybody will complete uh, these questionnaires. And then uh, week two, uh, which is what uh, they had defined as day plus five for auto transplant, day plus eight for allo. And then one month post transplant and three months post transplant. Um, so these measures, uh, this one should be taken out. That was a coping measure. Um, but the MQAL is uh, a measure. It's the McGill quality of life. 
uh, questionnaire to look at quality of life. Um, the FAC BMT, many of you might be familiar with. Um, we can only give that one after transplant because it asks questions specifically about uh, uh, undergoing transplant. Uh, the ESAS, many of you are familiar with, looks at symptom burden. Um, ECOG will track. And then the prognostic uh, prognosis and treatment perception questionnaire uh, is uh, a questionnaire that was developed by Jen Tamil and Arish Al Dawari. Um, it's a 10 item questionnaire that asks questions about prognosis, treatment expectations, um, preferences for information provision, and things like that. And then for the family caregivers, they'll complete the um, quality of life. I always forget the acronym for this quality of life. Um, I can't see it. Sorry, my screen is uh, in life threatening illness, family care caregiver version. Um, this questionnaire and the MQAL were both um, created by Robin Cohen, and uh, she's a Canadian researcher, and uh, and they've been used in, in patients with advanced cancer and family caregivers with advanced uh, with somebody who's got advanced cancer in their life. Um, and as I said, we're, we've removed the the coping uh, brief inventory, um, so there are fewer questionnaires that people have to fill out. Um, so yes, we're actively recruiting now. Uh, that the study has been registered with clinicaltrials.gov. Um, it's been sent out to local support groups, um, the, the Southern Alberta Myeloma Patient Support Group, and um, and thanks Desiree, uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, um, the local chapter, the Prairies chapter. Um, and I met last week with Chelsea, um, and I've been talking with Michelle, so you may see posters like this up at Tom Baker. Um, but if, if any of you have any patients that you think might be interested, you don't have to do anything other than passing out this poster or um, passing them my contact info and I will do all of the explaining and answer any questions they might have. And yeah, so just to kind of recap, um, we know that patients with blood cancers and those going through bone marrow transplant experience high symptom burden. Uh, we know that they don't receive routine, or don't, do not routinely receive palliative care. Um, but that early palliative care is indicated for patients with advanced cancer or those experiencing high symptom burden. And that we know that early palliative care can lead to improved symptom management, better prognostic understanding, improved quality of life for patients and caregivers, and in some contexts, improved survival. Um, and just to finish here, just to close, this wasn't a, a bone marrow or hematology patient, um, but it really made me think of some of our young transplant patients. Um, so the author described her experience in caring for a 29-year-old uh, male patient named Josh, who had recurrent metastatic esophageal cancer, who was in the ICU on high flow oxygen. And Josh wanted to leave the hospital to go on a trip with his dad. Initially, he wanted to go to Las Vegas, um, but he settled on a casino that was only three hours away. But his doctor, Dr. Reader Hayes, uh, worried what might happen to Josh if he left the hospital because he was so sick. And in the article, she talked about the conversation she'd had with him about the various different scenarios that could happen if he left the hospital. And she said, I began my conversations with Josh, assuming that either he had not thought of these things or that he was in denial about the severity of his, Ill of his illness. Thinking back to our ventilator talk, however, I gradually realized that he was not, generally speaking, that sort of patient. I began to slowly wrap my head around the fact that this patient was not afraid, at least not of the things that I feared on his behalf. It was not that he didn't believe the scenarios I presented to him. To him, dying on the floor of a casino after a great night out was not, the per was not the worst possible scenario. Dying in a cage, in our ICU, the last days of his life, orchestrated by others, waiting around in the least fun place on earth for his time to die was what scared him. And so I think, you know, we, we hear our patient stories, um, you know, we're able to ask them questions about what matters to them. Um, you know, maybe it is that they want to do everything under the sun. Um, I have a friend right now who's being treated for recurrent glioblastoma. Uh, he's my age, uh, so I would say relatively young, <laughs> um, but he's got young boys and he was presented um, by his oncologist. He was presented with some treatment options. And one option was a very aggressive uh, um, second surgery. Uh, and he was told that he might lose his ability to speak. He might lose his ability to read and understand um, writing and things. Um, but to him, that was worth it. That was a trade-off that was acceptable because he wanted more time with his family. Uh, so he is prepared to do whatever he could. Um, so again, in that context, I wouldn't necessarily say that that oncologist who agreed to, or the surgical um, the neurosurgeon 
I wouldn't give them black marks because that's what the patient wanted and that was appropriate in that context. Um, so I think, you know, if you have these honest conversations with people and we're clear about their goals and wishes, what they're willing to trade off, um, what's acceptable to them, uh, then I think that we're serving our patients well. Um, you know, I, I don't think that any of us make assumptions about what people want. Um, and and I, I know many of you very well on the call. And I know that you always have your, your patient's best interests at heart. So, um, you know, I think that my hope is that integrating palliative care for these patients um, might allow us to have some of these difficult conversations early on, um, might allow us to, um, you know, um, maybe provide that extra layer of support uh, for those patients for whom there might be a rapid transition or, or you know, for whom might experience sudden relapse or a treatment related complication. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop rambling and I'm hoping to uh, have some discussion if, if people have questions or comments. Uh, would love to hear about your own experiences. Thanks very much. Something else that came out in our, in our uh, qualitative interviews was the, the challenge that nurses sometimes experience when feeling like, um, not necessarily that treatment is futile, um, but that, you know, some moral distress associated with um, treatments, particularly when the patient, you know, everyone kind of seemed to know that the patient wasn't going to do well. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's tough too. So there is, you know, there's been some preliminary research done that has shown that palliative care can help support staff as well. Um, you know, we, we asked this in the, the qualitative studies, um, you know, should it be somebody, you know, a consultative model approach or should it be somebody embedded within the BMT team? And, you know, overwhelmingly people said it should be somebody who is embedded within the team. Uh, again, because there are those unique challenges that not everyone will necessarily understand about heme BMT, um, but also because there's a trust that needs to develop uh, and there's those relationships that are so important. Um, and especially with hematology and BMT, those relationships that are forged over time are so strong. Um, and so referring to a different team, uh, you know, it can be, it can be a bit challenging for sure. And uh, some of the patients felt like, uh, you know, that term abandonment was brought up at times. Uh, and then even staff felt like, you know, it was very difficult to turn care over to somebody else to a different team after having been involved with that patient and their family for so long. Thank you so much.